All right. Uh, so thank you, Tim, for the intro. Thank you, Dermot, for inviting me here. Uh, I want to stress this is a work in progress. I just started this postdoc about five weeks ago. Uh, so a lot of the analyses are very uh, preliminary, uh, and nothing is going to be set in stone or nothing's published yet. So I want everybody to think back to the first time they heard the word vampire bat and conjure that image up in their minds, and what did you think of or what did you imagine? So for many of us, including myself, we see these winged sky demons coming from the sky to suck us dry of our blood and to leave our desiccated corpses uh, across the landscape. When in reality, they're really just these little four-inch tall bats that fly around, typically in solitary, very uh, occasionally they feed in couples. Uh, but you can see an individual here is feeding uh, on a horse and here on a, a goat. And basically they have these four main teeth where they rip open a, a wound in an animal and then they'll lap up the blood meal. So I'm going to get a short movie here. Kind of show you over there feeding. And so here we have an individual on a donkey that's actually tied up, uh, sacrificed the science here. And you can see he's already made an incision here and he's slowly lapping it up. And you can see the tongue there, it's uh, drinking up the blood and these animals are actually really interesting. They're the only mammals that uh, survive solely on blood. And when a bat ingests the blood, you can, when you capture them, it's very easy to see who fed recently, who, who did not. They get completely engorged. And so they'll sop up in a, a very large quantity of blood every single night. And if they go one or two nights without food, uh, they can actually die. And so now most of the wounds um, to animals, livestock, are typically on the head, uh, the ears, sometimes on the throat, the neck. But occasionally you see them on the ankles. And so most of us think of bats as flying creatures. Uh, but the vampire bat is actually can move uh, pretty limberly here on the ground. So here he's just walking. There's actually videos online. You can see him running. That's just a little creepy. Uh, these guys can move pretty fast. And here we'll have two bats competing for basically the ankle of the donkey. And again, it's the same thing. They'll make a slow incision, um, and then they'll, they'll lap up that blood. And so when we think about, uh, so that's how they, they feed. Now, their actions are really important. So when we think about a vaccine for rabies virus in bats, we think about what the social behavior within the roost is. And so we think about within the roost, here we have a photo uh, of the inside of a, of a bat roost, a vampire bat roost. And we see this aggregation of about 10 or 12 individuals, and then we see a couple of lone individuals by themselves, and maybe another aggregation over here. Now typical roost size is between 50 and 300 individuals. Uh, you can get higher than that, lower than that. There have been observed 10 up to 5,000 individuals per roost. Uh, and these animals participate in social grooming. And so you can imagine when a bat goes out, takes a blood meal, gets a little bloody on the face, maybe on the back, wings, it'll fly back to the roost. They're in these uh, kind of spatially aggregated areas uh, and they're cleaning each other. So they're, they're pretty clean individuals. And similarly, they're, uh, they'll, they'll share in blood meal or food sharing. So here's a, an artist's depiction of a hungry bat and a bat who's already gone out and fed. Now the hungry bat is typically a bat who's ill or who's a juvenile. And so there's four main age classes of bats. There's the pups, and those are usually attached to a bat's stomach still. And then the juveniles, who uh, are no longer attached to the mother, but they, they're not able to fly yet, so they're moving around the inside of the bat cave. And then you have sub-adults and adults who, uh, the only main distinction that I can really tell is uh, one has, de the, in the males, they have developed testes and not. And I'll sh talk about that in a little bit. But here I've got another video to show you, and this will be the last video, I promise. Um, of some of the behavior within the cave. And so here we have spatial aggregation. So this is the inside of a cave, I believe in Mexico. And you can see in this little area here, there's gonna be about a dozen bats. And they're moving around, they're contacting each other. So bats don't just fly in and sit someplace uh, for, during the entire day. So these are nocturnal feeders, but they'll be moving around. Here we have a juvenile moving around on the inside of the cave. And so you can see the juveniles, even though they can't fly, they can still move around a little bit. In a couple of seconds, you're going to see uh, some social grooming where one individual is basically cleaning another's head. There we go. And what this is really doing is they're eliciting a, a blood meal. And so this bat on the bottom here, they'll zoom in in a second. 
is actually stimulating this juvenile. So this is an adult female, this is a juvenile. So this adult female is regurgitating blood meal and feeding this juvenile who wasn't able to go out and feed themselves that night. Now there's a, a really quick clip about mating, but it's really not that important. So when we think about rabies uh, in Latin America, it typically causes about 30 million, or it's been estimated to show that it's about $30 million a year in damage to livestock. Now some of us may think that $30 million a year across all of Latin America isn't really that much. But the majority of that damage happens to subsistence farmers. And subsistence farmers typically have less than three uh, animals in their care. And so the loss of even a single animal is devastating for their financial and well-being. Now, in Peru, where the study is located, it's about $700,000 a year in damage. Uh, and rabies has been around in Latin America for decades. And so there have been multiple control efforts, both with vampiricide and livestock immunization. And neither one's really been successful. So this vampiricide, which just looks like a, a gelatin paste, kind of like a Vaseline um, what am I thinking of? Uh, texture, uh, they capture bats. They basically smear it on that bat, release it back into the, uh, release it, the bat will pop back into the cave. And because they pers participate in social grooming, they'll clean the toxin off that animal, ingest it, and they'll die. And it's estimated that for every single bat that they give vampiricide to, approximately 10 other bats will die. So you can think of an r naught of 10, so if you're thinking about disease systems. Now, livestock immunization actually works really well. Unfortunately, it's very uh, costly. So you think they go out, they immunize all these cattle, all these pigs, all these horses, et cetera, et cetera, and you're preventing uh, those animals from being infected with rabies. However, it doesn't stop the chain of transmission of rabies. And so rabies is highly evolved, and I'll talk about that in a second. But basically, rabies is still happening in the background, even though those cattle, those livestock are not being infected. Second of all, immunization, uh, you have to go out every year. So if you think about beef cattle, they're frequently slaughtered, and then you get a new, um, you know, you get more cows in, the year, in two years or three years, and they need the immunization. And especially, it's really hard to go out, uh, if you think about childhood diseases, which is what I typically think about, uh, is to find all these rural areas in the Andes Mountains and basically uh, apply the immunization to all these different livestock. Now, rabies viral expansion has continued throughout Peru. Uh, and I'm going to talk about this paper. This paper just came out last year in Proc B. And this is my study system. And so in the last decade or so, they counted the total number of districts every year where rabies is endemic. And so you can see in the first couple of years, there's basically a decrease. And this is the total number for that particular year. So there's a decrease. But then in the last decade or so, we've seen this increase. And if we just look like the cumulative total number of districts that have been affected over the last decade, we, it's almost a straight linear increase in Peru. And so these are just total number of new districts that were rabies is endemic. Now if we focus on Peru, uh, here's a map of Peru outlined in, red, or in uh, black, and each district uh, has its own little black outline here. And we can see that when did rabies first uh, come into each different district. And then if we look at the number of rabies outbreaks in the last decade, we can see that a lot of them are focused in this purple region down here. So more than 200 outbreaks in this region alone, where there have been outbreaks, or new first reported outbreaks here in 2011 and 2014. But there's still about half that region that has not yet been invaded. And so if we focus on that region, which is the Aparimac region, I think that's how you say it, uh, we can look and to see how is this, how are the, the, this rabies virus transmitting or spatially spreading across Peru. And so ignore the colors for now. So the X and the Y is just la longitude and latitude. But in the background, you can see the gray, kind of looks like Italy over here maybe, uh, and then white. So white are areas above 3,600 meters. These are the Andes mountain range. And in gray, these are these valleys that basically drop down uh, and bats can easily traverse. So bats, the vampire bats typically don't go over 3,600 meters. Uh, they might occasionally go over like a, a small little region like this, uh, but it's unlikely that they're gonna uh, cross an entire mountain range like this. And so these two triangles up here, these are data that were found, found in 2012. This is rabies positive bats in 2012. And then if you follow both the red and the blue lines, this is the spatial spread of rabies from 2012 to 2014, all right? And then they built a model, a topographic spatial model, and to look at how far can the, the rabies spread every year. And so even though this paper was published in 2016, they used data up to 2014. And using uh, a couple of different methods that I'm not gonna get into, you can see that they estimated that the, the red rabid bats will get here in 2015, 2016, 2017. But you can see that they're not going above that altitude, right? They're, they're staying within the valleys. And you're gonna try to get uh, further within the valleys. 
And then the, the pie charts are basically just showing uh, surveys of farms. And these are just where, uh, so for this example, there were a bunch of farms surveyed and they wanted to know how many uh, of those farms had cattle or livestock with vampire bat bites. And so you can see that almost 100%. This is basically just showing that vampire bats exist beyond the range where rabies is currently endemic. And sure enough, here we are in 2017 and rabies is actually, uh, it's right about here, at least in this valley alone. I, I talked to Daniel just last week. Uh, and so this model seems pretty accurate. And so he also came out with a paper last year in PNAS that showed that males are the primary drivers of rabies expansion. So he has genetic data uh, going back over this whole time series from 2004 to present. And he's analyzed that and he was able to show that it's typically the males that are leaving the roosts and they're traveling these, these long distances to spread the rabies. Now when we think about this, how would that, or why is it the males? And so when, I'll, I'll show you some of the data later, but typically a, a roost or a colony is made up of about 40 to 45 percent males and 55 to 60 percent females. Now the reason for that is 50 percent males and 50 percent females are typically being born into the population. But by the time they move through the age classes from a pup to a juvenile to a subadult, there's, they're typically just kicked out. So you have a couple of alpha males that are kind of ruling the roost. Ah, that wasn't meant to be a pun. Uh, but then the, the subadults, by the time they're getting there, they're basically kicked out and they're the ones that are being forced to start their own, own new colony. So they're the ones that are traversing these long distances. Now there's another paper that came out uh, just this summer uh, by Rick Del Pietro. It looked at 36,000 bat captures in Argentina, vampire bat captures in Argentina. And it showed that over 95% of vampire bats don't move more than five kilometers in their entire lives. And you can see that this right here is 10 kilometers. And so they're moving at about 10 kilometers a year. So it's those 5% of bats that are actually spreading the rabies. So how is rabies transmitted? So rabies is extremely evolved and it's host specific. It can't go through intermediate hosts. Uh, and so in this example, we have a vampire bat that bites uh, a cow and that cow gets rabies. However, if another vampire bat comes in and bites that cow, it can't get rabies. It can't travel through this intermediate host. Similarly, if we have a different species of bat, so any bat, any mammal can get rabies. In this example, maybe a little brown bat or a fruit bat of some sort bites a vampire bat, this vampire bat can get rabies. However, this vampire bat is gonna go back to the colony, it's gonna get a little bitey, it's gonna bite everybody in its colony, but it can not transmit that rabies virus to another vampire bat. The only way to maintain this chain of transmission is for vampire bats to continuously bite other vampire bats. Now there's been, there's an active vaccine that's effective. It's been used in the U.S. and Europe. In the U.S. it's been used on the U.S. East Coast uh, to control the spread of raccoon rabies. And in Western Europe it's been used to actually eliminate fox rabies. And the way this is done is the vaccine is put in this little food bait and by the hundreds, they go up in helicopters and they basically just go over the forest and they just throw these little um, immunization packets out the window uh, or out of the, the door. Now, we can think of a similar way to bats. This isn't really gonna work. We can't just pack this with blood. No bats are really gonna wanna come bite that. Uh, so over the, the last year or so, there's been a recombinant raccoon pox vaccine developed and this is by our collaborators. Uh, I'll mention them at the end. Uh, but before I go any further, I also wanna stress that the Peruvian government where the study's being done uh, fully supports bat immunization if it can be shown to be effective. And that's kind of one of the motivating works of this project. So quickly to talk about uh, the vaccine for bats. Uh, this paper actually just came out on Tuesday, uh, but it's been shown to be 100% survival if this vaccine is given orally, 83% survival if given topically, uh, and 12% is the, the control survival. And so basically these bats are given a vaccine at some point, and then they're all challenged with the rabies virus. Uh, and this blue is if, they're, if it's given orally, red is if it's topically, and purple is a negative control. This green is another vaccine uh, that I'm not gonna talk about today. And so we, come up, we came up with three main questions for this project. One, with current technology, what sort of, of vaccine coverage could we, could we hope to achieve? And then two, uh, assuming we have uh, a vaccine that could work, that could spread, uh, would it be able to prevent viral invasion and would we be able to control transmission of rabies in endemic regions? And then finally, does contact structure play any role in the transmission of the vaccine? And so again, this is the aggregation, and if we're thinking of a topical vaccine, we're gonna, it really matters who contacts who. So I'm gonna focus with starting this first question, what level of vaccine coverage can be attained with current technology? So to do this, I uh, built a, a model, and this is just for those of you that have taken POPCOM or a disease ecology class, it's just a compartmental model, very simple. It's basic, a uh, little change up of the SIR. We have susceptible bats, Individuals are born into this class and people die at some rate. Now, 
the individual bats that come into this class are actually coming in seasonally. And so this is that paper that I talked about earlier, the 36,000 bats sampled in Argentina. And you can see that there's strong birth seasonality. So here is the solid line in diamonds is when bats are pregnant. And you can see that this is adult females that almost 70% of adult females are pregnant in the month of August slash September. Now, there's also this birth pulse here early in the year in February or March, uh, and this is typically when all the pups are coming out. And this is when we went out and sampled, and sure enough, here's uh, a couple of my photos of this actually albino vampire bat with a pup on its stomach. And so this bat actually flew out into the mist net, we captured it, uh, we tagged them both, uh, and then released them. So individuals are coming into the susceptible pool seasonally uh, with a birth pulse earlier in the year. And then at some rate, we're vaccinating them. So we're basically handpicking individuals out. We're going to cover them with a vaccine. We're going to re release them into the wild, right? And then at some point, they're going to decay into an immune class. And so some of you might be asking, what's the difference between a vaccinated class and an immune class? Well, this is important. So we have susceptible individuals, and we capture some of them, and we rub the vaccine all over them, right? They're covered in this vaccine and they can actively transmit the vaccine to these susceptible individuals, contributing to the force of infection here. So vaccinated individuals can help susceptibles move into the immune class. You can think of immune individuals who have received the vaccine but don't have any on them topically, so they can't contribute to this force of infection. Now, this is tip actually a, a subclass of this immune class, but I really just wanted to keep it separate to make it easy to, to see and understand. Now, individuals that are vaccinated with the vaccine, uh, that vaccine can't transmit forever. Uh, in, in the field trials, it looks like it lasts about two or three days. So I set the parameter to be about two and a half days while they'll be vaccinated, and then they'll decay into this immune class. And then finally, any, any, any individual who gets a vaccine is no, never always immune. There's some decay rate, right? So an immune individual will eventually, after some time, decay back into the susceptible pool. So what does this look like? Well, we can run this model, and what I can do is I can change two different parameters. I can change what the transmission rate is, because we have no idea what that is, and we can change the percent vaccinated. So that's what I'm going to do. So this is at a single time point, and I just want you to look at the axes. Don't worry about the colors for now. But we have a vaccinated percent of the population down here. So this is 20% of the population vaccinated, 40%, 60%, all the way up to 100% of the population is vaccinated. These are number of individuals that we stick in this V class. And then we have the transmission parameter, and this is basically when an S bat, a susceptible bat, contacts a vaccinated bat, what the chance of transmission is. So we have absolutely no transmission, all the way up to 50% of those bats are gonna, tra uh, there's gonna be a vaccine transfer, or 100%. And so after two days, why is this all red? So we have the, the scale of immune individuals. So I'm, I'm varying these two parameters, and I'm basically just looking at the proportion of immune individuals over the entire population. So anything red and orange is between zero and 50%. Once we start getting the yellow and green, it's 50, 50 to 70 percent, and blue and purple is really where we want to be. And so this is after two days, and I immu are immunized on, or I vaccinated on the first day, but after six days, we can already start to see something happen here, right? So these individuals are not purple because they're still in the V class, right? So if we have zero transmission, but 100 percent of the population is vaccinated, there's still a couple individuals up in this class that have yet to decay down. And then, of course, it makes sense that if you have higher transmission, you vaccinate a lot, you're going to have a higher overall immunity. Now, what does this look like over time? So each one of these X, Y points is a single simulation. There's 1,100 simulations shown here in this figure. So if you want, it'll be easiest to take a single point, like 0.4 and 0.4, and keep your eye on that. So I'm going to show a short GIF movie of the first two weeks of what happens uh, to the immunity. And so here you can see the, the vaccine is being not only transferred, but there's individuals being uh, decaying out of this vac vaccinated class into the immune class. And so after two weeks, it seems like we have pretty good coverage. Now, what does this look like on a longer term scale? Because it's unlikely that if a rabies invasion occurs, it's gonna happen within two weeks of us actually going out and vaccinating these bats. So here's the same scale uh, on a weekly schedule over the course of two years. You can see almost immediately after just a couple of weeks, you can see the decay, uh, the immune loss. So these are immune individuals going back to the susceptible pool. So you can see the overall coverage is dropping. You know, we had 80, 90%, now we're down to 70%. And here in the lower vaccinated percentage or vaccine transmission, we're at less than 50%. And so you can see after about a year, only in about half of the cases which with really high vaccinated percentage or very high vaccine transmission, are you actually gonna be able to have more than half the population immunized. And after two years, this is pretty much all red. So conclu uh, conclusions to this section. Well, what levels of vaccine coverage can be um, achieved with existing technology? And this leads to a couple of additional questions. Well, it kind of depends. Depends on what percentage of the population is vaccinated. 
So again, that's the x-axis. Depends on the transmission parameter, that's the y-axis. And it also depends on what time scale we're interested in. Are we interested in two weeks, one year, or two years, or even further down the line? Now, not all of these parameters are we can control. Now, percentage of population vaccinated, when you go out, and if you're actually gonna do this in the wild, like you have no idea how many bats you're capturing. You can capture 10 bats, maybe that's the entire colony, maybe it's 10 out of 5,000, you, you just don't know. What we can control is the vaccine transmission, or getting an, an idea of what that value is. And so in February, I went down to Peru, and we contributed, or we did a, a field test of this biomarker. And so a biomarker in this example is basically a proxy for vaccination. And so what we did is we went down to this little gully. Uh, this is actually a, a canal that was dynamited out decades ago uh, to allow water to stream down the mountain and basically not erode all these farmers' fields. Uh, we set up mist nets on each side of this cave. Uh, I stayed a little back. I didn't have my rabies vaccine. Jorge here just went with a T-shirt. Uh, Daniel went in there, scared all the bats, shone his flashlight, made some noise. These bats flew out. We can see we captured one here, and then we'd process them, and we applied this rhodamine B biomarker. And so what is rhodamine B? Well, it's a non-toxic biomarker that basically we can, we can apply to a bat, and then after 24 hours after it ingests this rhodamine, its hair will glow. And so what does this look like? This is what a rhodamine B positive individual looks like, and this is what rhodamine B negative individual looks like. And what is this actually doing? This is showing that a bat has taken up this biomarker, which again, we're using as a proxy for a vaccine. And so what do these results look like? Well, we went out on day one, caught 103 bats. Um, this is kind of the, the makeup of the population that we caught. We applied rhodamine to all these individuals. Uh, and what does this look like? Well, we can see we gave it to them orally uh, and then topically. And you can see immediately that they didn't really like it orally. It tastes pretty gross. Uh, it's, it actually doesn't have much flavor at all. Uh, and then we smeared it on their backs. And this is just to keep that glob from just immediately falling off. And so we smeared it on their backs uh, and then we released these bats back into the colony. We went back a week later, captured a bunch of bats, and we wanted to see what percentage of bats were positive then for the rhodamine B biomarker. So we captured uh, 46 new bats that were not captured the day one, and 18 of those 46 showed to be uh, rhodamine B positive. And doing some napkin math, it suggests about a 41 to 44 uh, percent transmission rate of rhodamine B. And so if we go back to these figures, that's right about here in the middle as we go across time. And so this will be dependent, or it's important to think about this, like where on the vaccinated percentage of the population we can be um, when we go out and actually go through with vaccination. So a couple other things. Uh, we don't actually know how much rhodamine uh, it takes to show up on the bat hair. So we did a couple of different experiments to give them really small doses and increase the doses to see uh, maybe these are negative, negative, and positive, positive. These samples are still being analyzed. Uh, and then the big question again is to transfer the rhodamine data over to uh, the vaccine, the actual vaccine transfer. And so this experiment was done uh, 16 different times at three different sites so we can get a better idea with error bounds on what the transmission of the rhodamine might be. So moving on to the second question, uh, how can, or can we prevent a viral invasion of rabies into a, a non-endemic region and then also control uh, the spread of rabies in endemic regions? And so for this, uh, I'm gonna combine uh, this model with a rabies model. And so the rabies, I'm gonna keep this up here for reference, but the rabies model is gonna look very similar. We still have susceptible individuals, and then we're gonna have a rabid individual come into the population. It's gonna bite the susceptible individual. They're gonna become exposed. And they'll sit in this exposed class for about 30 days. This is while the virus replicates within their, the bat body. And that individual will either move to the rabies class and die, or it'll become immune. Now, whether it goes, whether it gets rabid or goes immune, we can get from serology data. And then of course, with some, with immunity, they'll decay back and are susceptible at some rate. Uh, but we have serology data for the last 10 years. Daniel's been taking uh, blood samples of these uh, bats to look at whether they're positive or negative for rabies. And so we'll be able to calculate uh, these rates, uh, whether or not they, they're exposed to rabies and then whether they get rabies, which means they won't show up in the population, or whether they'll move to the immune class. Now we can just combine these two models. Oh, before I get there. So when we think about vampiricide, Basically what's happened uh, in the wild is what happens, a, a vampire bat goes out, eats or bites, takes a, a blood meal from a, a cattle or livestock, and it'll get rabies, right? Now, by that point, there's already an animal that's here in the rabbit class, uh, and it's likely because the r naught of rabies is so low, it's estimated to be about 0.6, and so it's extremely low. And remember, it takes a couple of weeks. So if a cow gets bit by a rabbit bat, it's not gonna develop rabies overnight and die the next day. It'll take a little bit of time. 
Now what's happening in the wild is these bats are biting the livestock, the livestock are dying at some point, the farmers are getting angry, they're going to Walgreens, they're picking up some vampiricide, they're going to catch as many bats as they can, and they're going to smother them in the vampiricide and re release them. However, at that point, this is already played out, and you typically only have individual and susceptible or immune class. Maybe you have one or two in the exposed class, but it's been shown that about 90% of individuals that are exposed typically go to the immune class. So very few actually go rabid. So this vampiricide in general is indiscriminately killing everybody or individuals in the colony. You aren't ever, you, it's unlikely you're gonna kill an entire colony using vampiricide, but generally you're gonna kill both susceptible and immune individuals. And what this is doing is it's lowering the overall immunity of that cave, allowing for more susceptibles being born to join the susceptible pool. So you're raising the susceptibles and lowering the, the immune percentage of the population. So now we can combine these two models into a single, uh, a single model. And this is the exact same model as these two combined, only I have two different immune classes. And this is basically showing that an individual who's vaccinated, their decay rate's a little bit faster. That vaccine, that protection won't last as long as somebody who's acquired natural immunity. And so if you acquire natural immunity, that means you've actually been exposed to the virus. Uh, your antibodies are typically gonna be a little bit higher. Uh, and ra rabid individuals can bite either susceptible or immune vaccinated, and they can move into this immune natural class. I mean, they can also bite immune natural, but they'll just stay in that class. All right? So what do these look like? So here I'm gonna run the same model that the susceptible vaccinated immune model, only I'm gonna add rabies invasion on week eight and week 52. These just correlate to day 50 and 400 in the model. And now remember, all I'm doing is taking out one susceptible individual and adding one rabid individual. And then we're gonna see how this plays out. Remember they sit in this exposed class for about four weeks, for 30 days before they're either gonna to move to an immune class or they're gonna become rabid themselves and continue the transmission. So I'm just gonna play this weekly model and so right now we have a, a bat invading. And it's gonna take a little while for that bat to go to the exposed class, the immune class, and then we can see that it's a little bit different here, right? So we see this expansion in the middle, especially these lower vaccinated per percentages. And we see overall coverage after about a half a year at between 60 and 70%. And this is maintained, right? And so now we can wait. And when week 52 arrives, we have another uh, rabid individual come, and come in. Let's see if it'll show up here. You'll be able to see, there might be marks up here, you can see it on my computer. Well, uh, coverage is slowly increasing from a light green to a dark green up here, and then at the very end of this model, it, it starts to fade away, and these are immune individuals going back. But what we can see here is basically, we're starting with a little bit higher uh, immune coverage, and then as an invasion comes, it, it basically boosts that value and maintains it longer, because we have more people, in the, or more bats in this immune natural class than we do in the vaccinated class. Now this might be easier to see side by side. So let's play this one more time. And remember it'll be about week 12 or 13 where we start to see differences. And so we can see while this continues to fade and we get lower overall coverage, we can see here that we see the expansion. And what this is, is these lower individuals who didn't get vaccine coverage, they now have natural coverage, right? And this basically stays because this is a, lo a longer decay rate. While this slowly, this wave front moves across of lower immune coverage, this stays the same and then we get another invasion and it only boosts it further. We don't see as big of a difference here when we have 70% coverage because we have a lot more classes in these two, or we have a lot more individuals in these two classes than we do susceptibles at this point. So finally, uh, how does contact structure uh, among bats influence the spread of the vaccine? And so these are data that I just got two weeks ago. Uh, all the modeling, I was able to start to begin this project but the data didn't come until two weeks ago. So I'm just showing you illustrations of the data thus far. Uh, I haven't been able to analyze them. So in humans, we know contacts are, are among same age individuals are, are, the, are, are very common. So if you look at a 10 year old, their most common contacts are with other 10 year olds. If you look at 20 year olds, their most contacts are with other 20 year olds. If you look at 40 year olds, other 40 year olds, right? But we also see this interesting pattern where, where we see a 30 year old and a newborn, 40 year old and five year olds, et cetera, et cetera. Now what these are, these are parents, right? And this figure is actually a mirror image down this bottom left to top right axis. So this is showing that an individual that's 40 contacts a 20 year old the same age, or the same as a 40 year old here contacts a 20 year old. So when we apply this to bats, and I'm sorry I forgot a heat map here, uh, but basically we think of a lighter value as lower contacts and a darker value equals more contacts. So I thought of the same thing when we think of bats. So juveniles, since they don't move much, maybe they don't contribute much contact to anybody other than adult females that are coming in to feed them, right? Subadults, uh, maybe they're contacting different classes of adults. 
Uh, and adult females and adult males are contacting each other a lot. So this is reproduction, this is feeding, uh, this is basically going out. Now, how we did this is we went to the field and these are individuals who are not marked with rhodamine at all. We caught a couple of bats, uh, put them in the, a plastic bag with UV powder and gently massage the powder over their bodies. We take this UV coated bat, put it in a little bird cage, uh, and then another bat that had no application of anything, we also put it in the bird cage, put a blanket over this bird cage, and let them hang out for about 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, they weren't very happy about being caged, but I can tell you that after about 20 minutes, uh, we took the, the bat that was not given UV powder, uh, and we very scientifically looked inside a dark bag uh, with a UV light to, to sure enough see that the UV powder was transmitted to this other bat. Now the field guys are much more professional than us. Uh, when they went out, they did this all at night. Uh, they applied the, the UV powder and then they released them, but then they recaptured. They actually grabbed the UV light and they just showed it over the, the mist net so they can identify them immediately. This one has blue powder, this one has red powder, this one has orange powder, et cetera, et cetera. And so we went out into the wild, into the wild. The, the field team went and did this experiment. Uh, and I'm gonna kind of walk you through a hypothetical example. So for each one of these, I used a, a population estimate uh, Schnallman method uh, for each different site uh, to estimate the population number. This is using multiple mark recapture um, time points. And then I looked at the sex ratios and estimated a, approximate number of males and females in each colony. Now I want to stress that the number here, uh, there are confidence intervals here, but for me to make these figures, uh, I needed just a single number, so I took the average number for these. So in this example, site A, we have 44% male, 56% female, all right? Now on day one, we went out, we captured three female bats, and, and we applied red UV powder to these individuals. So they have this thick circle, all right? We went back one day later, and we captured, say, 10 bats, all right? Of those 10 bats, uh, three didn't have any UV. Three were the same ones that we caught before, but we had four new bats. So what this is showing is that these three bats that we captured, these three female adult bats that we captured, uh, overnight, they contacted four other adult female bats, all right? Now we can think the same thing with males. We have eight males that were given blue UV powder and overnight they contacted five other unique males and transferred that UV powder to them. Now we can also think that, well, it doesn't have to be red and blue, they can cross over. So for example, these three female adult bats, they actually contacted 13 adult male bats. So everything within the circle counts, all right? And these eight uh, adult males that were marked in blue UV, they actually contacted 11 other adult males. So what do these data look like? Well, this is our test site where we, we tested out the UV and it's pretty straightforward, right? We marked 20, or sorry, we marked 10 uh, adult females. We went back and there were six new adult females that were marked with red. Uh, and then the blue, we, we marked eight and one. So that's pretty straightforward. Now they can get a little bit more complex. So this is a, a different site in July. We have a much larger population. We marked 18 adult females in red. Uh, there were five new adult females in red. There was one adult male. Um, and so these guys right here were actually new cap newly captured adult females that were marked in blue. Three of them were not captured before, but two of them were actually the ones that were applied the red UV powder. And we can go through. So we actually did this with uh, juveniles as well. So those that, these circles that kind of cross the boundary are juveniles. Um, I did divide them. This is one male and three female juveniles. Uh, and everything's color coordinated. So red is female, uh, blue is male, and purple is juveniles. In the field, we actually rotated the colors to make sure it wasn't the UV giving us a bias. So maybe red shows up a lot better than blue or purple or orange. Um, but we can basically look um, at all these different capture sites. And I do want to stress that juveniles, uh, they were hand caught on the first day of marking. So basically, we had the field team, they went into the cave, they plucked these juveniles off the walls, coated them in UV powder, processed them, and then walked back in there and stuck these juveniles back on the cave wall. No juveniles were ever caught in a mist net, which also kind of shows this pattern why there's no ever juveniles caught on days two and three with any colored powder. Now, like I said, this is just a, a visualization, but if you, if you close one eye and look sideways, uh, you can kind of start to come to some conclusions from that. And so if we look at the contactor and contact E, and I threw out subadults because that just made the, the figures really messy and it's really hard to distinguish, like I said, between subadults and adults, uh, but juveniles really aren't contacting anybody at all, all right? And and again, this, so this process is difficult because an individual marked in blue and an individual marked in red, uh, if they contact each other, uh, it's not always we capture the same two bats again. They're not going to be marked with both blue and red. Maybe it's just the male that's blue and red and the female still just red. 
And so this leads us to a very preliminary conclusion that adult females are contacting other adult females, but they're not really contacting that many other adult males. Meanwhile, the adult males are really contacting the adult females at a high ratio, and they're also contacting other adult males. So to kind of wrap up these different points, uh, what levels of vaccine coverage can be attained with existing technology? Uh, the answer is, it, it depends again on the time scale, what you're looking for, uh, but really it, it's not very high. Now, because the r naught of rabies is so low that maybe you don't need over 50% coverage. Maybe this 20, 30% is enough to prevent invasion. Uh, I'm still working on that. Uh, but when we think about technology and how we apply the vaccine, what we're doing is we're going out there, hand capturing bats, applying the vaccine and releasing them in the wild. One of my first thoughts after completing the field work and doing this is, well, that's, a, that's kind of a pain in the butt to do. You know, I'm a, I'm a computer guy, so I don't usually go in the field. Uh, and capturing all these bats was really a lot of work. Uh, but what happens if we could aerosolize a vaccine? And you can go in there with something like um, a pesticide pump and go into the cave and basically just pump and spray this vaccine on the bats um, during the day while they're, while they're sleeping. So that's just a, a thought that occurred. And I talked with Daniel about it. And it seems that um, it, it might be possible, but this is an avenue that we're, we're just briefly thinking about at this point. Uh, and then final, or secondly, uh, what about prevention and control of rabies? And so these uh, look a little bit more promising, at least in endemic areas, because you get the, the natural boost and you get the rabies where it's endemic, uh, causing a lot of individuals to go to this immune natural class. And so after a year or two years, you have much higher overall uh, coverage levels of the vaccine. Now, I do wanna stress, uh, that a lot of the parameters here are just very quickly done as you get a working model. And I still have to go back to the serology data to get a couple of these other parameters, such as transmission, uh, the waning uh, from the, both the immunity class and the vaccine, uh, and then the percent that moves into the INR classes from the exposed class. And then I also haven't looked yet to see what percentage is basically needed to prevent rabies invasion. Like I said, there's been a lot of work previously on vampire bat rabies and shown the r naught is typically about 0.6, uh, shown down here. Uh, and, and I also haven't mentioned how many die. So in this case, with the rabies invasion, you have two different invasions. Depending where you're at on the XY scale, you have somewhere between uh, 15 and 33 bats dying, and the total population here is about 200. Uh, so you're looking at about 15% of the bats in some of these situations are dying. Uh, and then finally, um, so some of the, the data from the literature show that uh, there's a high natural immunity. So in, the, in areas without vaccination, this immune class is about 11%. The r naught's 0.6, but there's high survival. So about 90% of people or individuals that are exposed move to the immune natural class. Now, I haven't had a lot of time with these models, but it seems the only way that you can do this if you, is if you ramp up the number of invasions. So you have frequent invasions. So not once a year, not once every other year, but you have multiple ra rabid bats coming into a colony and constantly boosting. And it has such a low r naught uh, that very few die, but you still maintain about 10% in that natural immunity class. And then finally, how does contact structure among bats influence the vaccine spread within a colony? Uh, again, this is just a, I've only had the graphic visualization and I need to analyze this and I really need to think about, uh, so a lot of the bats that were captured uh, had UV powder, but they were a lot of the recaptures. So in this example, we marked almost half the females on day one, uh, 62 out of the 130, estimated 130. Uh, and even though it only shows we had two other new females that were marked, we probably caught about another 40 of these previously marked um, female bats. And so if there is variation in contact, right, so that's not just uh, all that, that contact matrix that I made for bats, if it isn't all just like a light purple or a dark purple, we really need to think about uh, who's contacting who and we need to build that into the model. Uh, I mean, this is just a, a simple contact matrix. So we, we change this lambda transmission parameter to depend on who you're contacting. Um, and then with future directions, uh, again, all we have is really the rhodamine, and we really need to compare the rhodamine to the vaccine. So everything we've done in the field has been the rhodamine as a proxy for the vaccine. We have a vaccine that works, but there are no, that, that we know of, captive colonies of vampire bats where we can really test the vaccine to see how long it can last, and basically what level you need to gain the proper number of antibodies. Uh, and then also how long can the vaccine survive uh, in the wild? Um, so this has been shown that in the lab, if it just sits on a, a countertop, it can survive about three days. In the model, I have it at two and a half days, decay rate. Um, and then the seasonal timing of application. As I've shown you here, the seasonality uh, of births. Uh, so what you're thinking, or what you can think about is in April and May, there's a lot of mating occurring. So there's a lot of contact. There's a lot of males that are fighting for females. And so there's increased contacts here in April and May. So potentially that'll be a better time to apply a topical vaccine 
than say here in August and September when you have a lot of pregnant females and there's probably not as much contact going on. And then also whether you want to target males or females. Again, this will depend on the contact structure, but behaviorally, it's been shown that the males typically leave the roost about an hour earlier than the females to feed. And this is because the males are not dominant. Uh, the males will go out and feed, and if a female happens to come along, they'll basically just kick them off that spot and they'll take over that feeding spot. So the males typically leave a little bit earlier. So if we think about forward to vaccination, when are we gonna go out and capture it? It'll depend. Well, if we think that the males are transmitting the vaccine and they're making a lot more contacts than females, maybe we go out earlier in the night and make sure we capture males when we actually go out and vaccinate. Uh, seasonal variation in context, I've kind of already talked about, and the spatial spread. So I've already talked that rabies, the spatial spread is extremely unlikely given it's occurring. Uh, it's even more unlikely with the, these, the vaccinated individuals uh, to have, to vaccinate a single colony and hope that jumps to another colony. As I've mentioned, the vaccine, uh, we've built it in only lasts about two and a half days. And for that individual to jump to a new colony and start a new transmission chain of events is just extremely unlikely. And even if it did, you think the total proportion of vaccinated, so in fact, those color maps that you're at the very left, a very low percentage of the population vaccinated. Uh, so it's very unlikely to provide protective coverage. So you have to think about going to every single colony and applying the vaccine at, to every single colony, um, unless we can come up with a, a better vaccine that can survive there in the wild. And then finally, thinking forward to other pathogens, uh, lots of us here in North America know of white nose, uh, slowly killing off bats in the winter where they basically shake themselves to death. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank uh, my collaborators. So Tony and Jorge up here at USGS and University of Wisconsin, they're the ones that uh, really pressed these pharmaceutical companies to come up with this vaccine. And they've done a lot of the, the testing themselves with it, and they're the ones that are the authors of that paper that just came out on Tuesday. Daniel's over here on the right, he's the PI on this grant. Carlos and Nestor uh, are in charge of the biology department at Cayetano Heredia University in Peru. Uh, and Carlos Teo, uh, he's in charge of all the field guys and he's got the worst job of all, getting those guys in shape. Uh, finally, I'd also like to thank the King Lab for uh, feedback on a preliminary talk I gave to our lab a couple of weeks ago. And with that, I'll take questions. Yeah, Byron. Yeah, so when I talk about endemic rabies, I think of within a single region. So when we think about the, sorry, I'm gonna turn this down a little bit. Uh, that uh, Aparimac region, the one in purple on the, one of the earlier maps. So it's not endemic within a single colony. It's constantly moving between colonies. Uh, so there are hundreds and hundreds of vampire bat colonies uh, within each one of these regions in Peru. There's a, a ton of bats all across the country. And so it's not actually endemic within a single colony it's constantly doing these source sync dynamics where we have a bat from one colony or there's an outbreak of rabies and there's a couple of bats that leave and they're going to other colonies, but it's not just happening there, it's happening in other colonies. There's constantly source sync dynamics. So invasion and die outs of the, the rabies, uh, rabies virus. Does that make sense? Yeah, so I haven't looked at spatial transmission at all, but what we can think about here uh, is when you look at the, um, the model where I had vaccination and rabies, we can see that the total number of immune individuals was in the green, was, they were basically fl that fluorescent green, that beautiful fluorescent green. Uh, so they're between 60 and 70% coverage. So you can imagine that that only allows 40% of individuals that can actually be infected with rabies, right? And so in, in situations where we have 60%, 70% coverage of the vaccine, there's only 40% susceptible. So when a rabid individual comes in, it's got to actually bite those susceptible individuals. They have to go to the exposed class and then they also have to move to back to the rabies class for that chain to continue. But again, like I mentioned that 90% of the individuals that end up in the exposed class actually go back into the immune class. So very few will actually end up as the rabies. So if we can provide that baseline level of vaccination in the endemic regions for rabies, where it's source sync dynamics are occurring, uh, it seems like we might be able to get a high enough level of vac vaccination to basically eliminate rabies in the short term. Again, very preliminary. Yeah. Right. 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 Uh, it just can't act through intermediate hosts. 
Oh, absolutely. So if you think, so when I was growing up in the 80s, we had these great public service announcement videos on VHS, you know, see this terrifying dog, and they probably stuck like a Pepsi AC in its mouth or something. It's frothing, uh, like it's, and you're riding your like, little bike, and you're like, don't run, don't, or walk, don't run. Uh, and so if like a human can get bit by a, a, a rabid cow, a rabid vampire bat, or another rabid human, uh, and they can get rabies from that. Well, not a human, sorry. Uh, but uh, a human can get bit by another animal that has rabies, and they can die. So it's 100% it's mortality without treatment uh, in most species, uh, in pretty much every species other than bats, which is why this is such an interesting study species. But yeah. Uh, so about 10%. So of individuals that are exposed to rabies, so everybody that moves to that E class, about 90% will go to the immune class and only about 10% will actually develop rabies. And once you actually get full-blown rabies, you, it's about two days lifespan. And so I, I glossed over this, and this is a, a very simple model at this point, but you actually don't have to have rabies to transmit it. You can be in that E class, and so while you're kind of deciding if you're going to be, become immune, or if you're going to go rabid, you can actually transmit rabies. You can't transmit it that whole time period, but basically while you're in that class, the, the virus is replicated inside your body, um, and those bats have been shown that they haven't yet developed rabies, but they can bite another bat and continue the tra chain of transmission. Mm -hmm. Ah, uh, good question. I don't know. Um, so a lot of the stuff here, uh, so I'm used to working on human diseases, but we know contact rates, we know term forcing, you know, basically every parameter is very straightforward. So when I started asking Daniel about some of the possible parameters, he's like, we don't know, we don't know, we don't know. Uh, there's just a lot of the natural history that's just not known, especially within the caves. Um, and so that's why, so this UV, this contact stuff, this is the first that's ever been done on vampire bats, which kind of surprised me a little bit, but I'm not, I'm not, I wasn't really a wildlife uh, guy. So uh, a lot of this is still is new and a lot of the parameters really aren't known. Uh, and that's why I'm kind of varying some of the parameters. I'm, I'm, only, I'm only looking at transmission and back, number percent vaccinated right now. Uh, but a lot of these parameters, they aren't set in stone. There, there is variation to them and I still need to look into that. Yeah, so that's a great question. Uh, we don't know anything. Uh, and, but we, we think that it's random. Uh, so it's not like all the females cluster together or all the adults cluster together. It's pretty much, and, it, and a single bat doesn't always go back to the same spot. Nobody's got fives on a spot. Uh, every night they go out and feed and every morning they'll come back. And as far as we can tell, they kind of grab their spot at random. Now, at the University of Glasgow, there's a guy that works on uh, behavior. Uh, he works, he's typically works on birds, but he has a, really, a lot of really cool high-tech cameras, and he looks at basically their, the spatial movement of birds as they're flying. I'm sure a lot of us know that birds are really cool. Uh, but what I've really uh, thought about is, hey, I'm sure he's got some uh, you know, cameras that we can use in the dark, and we can basically just focus in, maybe paint uh, UV light on, on an individual and basically watch them throughout the night, how much they move, where they move to, how many different bats it's contacting. Um, and so that's something that we're going to talk about. I'm actually going to, to Glasgow next week, um, and we're going to kind of talk about some of the next steps and figuring out what's going on uh, within the colony uh, during the day when they're not feeding. Uh, because these, these videos are, are some of the only evidence that we have of what we know that's going on. And all you can really see is they're moving around a lot. Uh, they're disturbed because there's also a giant light flying at them. So it's really unknown at this point. Yeah, and so that's, that's another great question. Yeah, so uh, it's, they aren't just living in these canals that I showed. They live in caves. They live in, exactly, trees are struck by lightning. Basically, anything that can protect them from the rain where they can find some darkness. Um, and the other thing is, is that they, always, they don't always just have one cave. So it's been shown that they typically have one roost where they typically live in, but then it's been shown that there's a, breed, a breeding roost as well. So that's typically where the adult females go when they're pregnant. Uh, and they hang out in a roost. It's not like 10 kilometers away. It's, it's typically within 500 meters, but there is that secondary roost. And so at this site where we went in uh, February, Cardal, uh, LMA4, uh, we actually, that was going to be one of our study sites. Uh, and so we went in January during the day, caught them. Again, not the greatest idea, but 
for us Americans. It was like, yeah. And it was my first time in the field doing uh, the vampire bat work. Um, but basically, we caught them one day, we went back a week later, captured them again, and the field guys, they went back there three weeks later, and they, they spent four hours capturing bats, and they were able to capture four bats. So they had actually moved roost because they were disturbed. And that's a lot of also what's happening in Central America. So a lot of the vampiricide is actually being applied in Mexico, uh, because that's where they have very large cattle farms, um, and that's where you know, farmers are really worried about the bottom dollar. Um, and so what happens when they lay out the vampiricide and when the bat sees all of its buddies leave, like dying, they're going to take off. Or if they're disturbed, they're going to take off. And they can hide out there for weeks or months on end. Uh, and so this site that we went to in February, uh, at last check they went back in August and it's starting to have some of the bats come back. Uh, but yeah, it's really interesting because they aren't always stationary and it's not like they're born in this colony. The females, for example, are born in a colony, they're going to stay there their entire life. If they are disturbed, they will go someplace else. Yeah, that's, that's another really interesting question. Um, and so when we think about livestock uh, and some of these, at least the larger farms in Mexico, for example, these are livestock that weren't there hundreds of years ago, right? However, we can also think that there probably were a lot of feral animals there, feral pigs, for example, uh, before the farmers came in. And so there was always some sort of food source there. However, now those food sources are, at least in the larger farms, are more concentrated uh, and it's you know, if a, if a farmer loses one of those animals, he's going to be pretty upset. He's going to look to exterminate the bats. However, if you have a, a subsistence farmer that just has three or four bats, he's still going to be upset. Uh, but the government's probably not going to listen to him as much because he's losing one of three bat or one of the three cattle. And it's and it's typically um, you, you got to think about the carrying capacity. So there need, these, these bats need food at, at the very least every other night. Otherwise, they're going to die. <laughs> And some of these colonies are enormous, right? Up to 5,000 individuals. So all the colonies that we saw or that I talked about here, looked at they maxed out about 250 bats. But that's 250 bats that need blood meal every single night, right? And there's only so many feral animals that you can take a blood meal from. So yeah, they probably are taking blood meal from uh, livestock and they also take it from humans. So uh, well, at least they'll swoop down and make the initial incision in a human and then the human will probably swat it away. More aware than the livestock. Did that answer your question, kind of? Yeah, so it also depends on what livestock are there um, compared to what type of feral animals were there before. Um, and I don't have those, those data. I mean, if you think there's more food, there's likely going to be more bats, more bats, rabies transmission chain is going to be more likely to continue. Thank you, guys.